Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the fifth installment of our Learning from the Experts Offshore Wind webinar series. I am Morgan Brumbauer, the Offshore Wind Marine Fisheries Manager with NYSERDA's Offshore Wind Team, and it is my pleasure to be joined by today's expert, Duncan Sokolowski of Tetratech, who will be giving a presentation on offshore wind submarine cabling. Before I introduce our speaker, a few reminders for participants on today's call and some background information on this webinar series. Next slide, please. First, if you are experiencing any technical issues, please contact Sal Graven at the email address on the bottom of this slide. This webinar is being recorded and the recordings and presentation slides for all webinars in the Learning from the Experts webinar series will be available on NYSERDA's website at the address on this slide. As a reminder, all participants have been muted. We will have a, a Q&A session following this presentation, so please use the Q&A function to submit your questions for the speaker. Next slide, please. New York State is working to advance the responsible and cost-effective development of at least 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035. Offshore wind is a critical component in achieving the state's goals of 70% renewable sources of electricity by 2030 and 100% zero emission electricity by 2040. While offshore wind has been providing clean energy to other parts of the world for several decades, this industry is brand new to New Yorkers. To provide interested stakeholders and members of the public with accessible, impartial information and opportunities for engagement on specific topics of interest, NYSERDA is hosting this educational webinar series called Learning from the Experts to connect the public with independent experts in key topics of offshore wind. We endeavor to select Learning from the Experts speakers based on their expertise rather than an alignment of opinions with NYSERDA or the State of New York. If you would like to suggest a topic or speaker for future webinars, you can email us at offshorewind at nyserta.ny.gov. Also note that the views and opinions expressed in this presentation are those of the presenter. Next slide, please. It is now my pleasure to introduce Duncan Sokolowski. Duncan is an experienced and multi-talented submarine cable expert, having started his cabling career over 20 years ago as a remotely operated vehicle uh, supervisor and cable joiner within the telecommunication telecommunications industry. Over the last decade, Duncan has broadened his areas of expertise to include submarine power cables for the offshore wind and power transmission industries. Having worked for submarine cable installers, manufacturers, engineering consultants, as well as elsewhere within the supply chain, Duncan has expertise in many cable sectors and broadens TetraTech's already strong capabilities within this topic. Thank you, and I will now hand the presentation over to Duncan. Thank you, Morgan, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you to NYSERDA for this opportunity to, to present on, uh, on submarine cabling. It's an interesting subject. I hope everyone learns something, and I'm looking forward to attempting to answer some questions um, afterwards. So uh, I thought I'll just start with um, explaining a little bit about the, the potential scale of the of the industry. Uh, Morgan mentioned that uh, the New York New York State has a target of about uh, 9000 megawatts of, of offshore wind. Um, if we expand that to the to the northeast of the US, um, you know that expands to about twenty to thirty thousand megawatts. So you know, and how that um, translates into the cabling aspect is that uh, that amount of power, if we're looking at twenty thousand megawatts, will require approximately sixteen hundred turbines. If we're looking at twelve megawatt turbines, which is quite standard at the moment, uh, which would require about fifty or so export cables, totaling approximately three thousand miles. Um, as well as a couple of thousand interarray cables. Um, at the moment, the wind turbine spacing is uh, is about a mile between turbines, so that translates to roughly 2,000 miles of uh, of array cabling. 
So what does the actual cabling look like? Uh, there's two main technologies in uh, subsea power transmission. We have uh, AC uh, or alternating current and we have DC or direct current. So, uh, you know, the battle between Edison and Westinghouse, which started in the early 1900s, uh, you know, to this day is, is carrying on. Both have their pros and cons. Uh, we see here on the left, uh, these two slivers are AC cables. They have three power conductors, one for each electrical phase. Uh, they also contain one or more, uh, usually a maximum of three uh, fiber optic packages, uh, which carry data and whatnot to and from the wind farm. Uh, these are contained in a single bundle with uh, normally galvanized steel armoring uh, and covered with a layer of polypropylene yarn. Um, if you look on the right hand side of the screen, uh, we see uh, direct current technology. So, uh, the industry standard at the moment is a, is a bipolar system. We have uh, a bundled uh, cable with the, um, with the power, with the, with the return, and um, a small third cable which has the fibers in it. Um, and these are bundled as they, uh, as they leave the ship and get laid in a kind of single package of this sort of oval shape. So um, HVDC cables do exist in the New York Bight area already. There's the Neptune project um, going from New Jersey to uh, Jones Beach on Long Island. Um, and then there's the uh, uh, cable that crosses Long Island Sound as well. If we look at the properties of these cables, um, they all vary, so it's kind of uh, indicative purposes only. Uh, if we look at array cables, they're normally about uh, four to six inches outside diameter, weighing between about 13 to 34 or so pounds per feet. Uh, the cross sections of the conductors range depending where in the wind farm they are. So the, uh, the cables that are further out on a string of turbines tend to be smaller because they have less current to, uh, to carry. Uh, whereas the cables which um, carry power from maybe a whole string of turbines to the substation will be uh, will be larger. Uh, and the voltage we operate at has uh, traditionally been about 33,000 volts, but uh, the latest wind farms are going up to about 66,000 volts, uh, which means you can get more power in a, in a given cross section, or you can reduce the cross section, which leads to a, a smaller and uh, more cost effective cable. If we look at the export cables, which are the cables that take the power from the entire wind farm to shore, uh, and we're talking about AC uh, cables, then they are quite a bit larger. So they're up to about 13 inches in uh, external diameter, uh, weigh roughly 85 pounds a foot or so in, in air, um, and they have cross section, um, conductor cross sections of about 800 to a maximum of say 1400 square millimeters. Voltage range is also a lot higher about 132 to 345,000 volts, which means they can transmit, transmit power over a longer uh, distance with less electrical losses. Practical maximum distance uh, varies a little bit, but it's in the order of 60 to 70 miles for AC cables. And you know a single HVAC cable, as a rule of thumb, can transmit about 400 megawatts of power. So an 800 megawatt wind farm would, uh, generally speaking, require two export cables. If you look at HVDC, uh, the cables are smaller, uh, about six inch diameter for the for the cable. Uh, they are a little bit lighter, cross sections bigger, but it's a single cable uh, for the conductor. Uh, voltage level is higher. Um, the losses are, are lower, so they can transmit power over a, a much a much greater distance. Um, at the moment, the longest submarine HVDC cable uh, is about 450 miles, and that's the North Sea Link in Europe. Um, and they can also transmit a lot more power, so about 2,200 megawatts um, for uh, for DC cables at the moment. So you could, in theory, uh, you know, connect several wind farms to shore via one uh, bundled HVDC cable. So uh, recently, um, I think everyone is is aware that the Vineyard Wind Project um, achieved its permitting consent. Uh, one of the last hurdles was a review of the um, final environmental impact statement. So um, I went through that and it was an exciting read. I just wanted to pluck out some of the um, points that they raised which pertain to cabling. Uh, so we can see um, their measure. Uh, so so they, they plucked out um, possible impacts from cabling um, and mitigation measures that, uh, that BOEM uh, required to, um, you know, 
in order for the project to go ahead. So what, uh, point 11 was uh, to do with dredging cable installation methods and, and, and timing. Uh, you know, they just made a statement that cable installation activities, please use the least environmentally harmful method. Um, they required an anchoring plan. So if a vessel uh, was going to do the installation of the cable, such as a barge with um, with anchors, they wanted a clearly defined anchoring plan so that the impact from anchors could be, uh, you know, could be gauged. They wanted uh, the final cable protection and we'll cover cable protection measures in, in a little bit. Um, they wanted uh, natural or engineered stone that mimics the surrounding seafloor, you know, in the particular location of um, of that cable. You know, and with the idea of reducing, you know, any impacts, uh, you know, creating, uh, you know, habitats for, for species and wildlife and things like that. They wanted um, more evaluation of the benthic habitat prior to, to cable laying. Uh, and they actually did specify the number of samples and video surveys that they wanted to be uh, wanted to be undertaken along the export cable route. Uh, they also required post-installation cable monitoring. I'll cover that a little bit later as well. Um, quite an onerous requirement for uh, for cable burial surveys uh, to ensure that the cables remain buried, so that their impacts to the seabed, are, you know, remain, you know, remain as as minimal as possible during the operational um, phase. Uh, they wanted electronic charting information made public. Um, some funds created to compensate the fishing industry for any uh, disruption uh, during cable laying, etc. Um, and they wanted quite a detailed cable burial plan um, uh, publicised that the Coast Guard and Boehm could uh, could review. So those are the sorts of things that Boehm and the the permitting authorities were looking for uh, out of the environmental impact statements and the recommendations they came up with in order to mitigate any perceived. Uh, negative impacts. So we go on to uh, the question of, you know, how are submarine cables protected from external aggression? And conversely, how are external users of the seabed protected from the cables? Um, you know, step one is careful route planning. So uh, this is uh, undertaken fairly early on in the project planning phase. Um, the actual location of the wind farm will be known. There might be some options as to grid connection points on shore, but a desktop study will be undertaken, which will, uh, you know, look at all the the risks and environmentally sensitive areas, shipping lanes, anchorages, areas of fishing, uh, seabed topography and geology, uh, things like uh, dumping grounds, unexploded ordnance areas where there's dredging areas where there's a lot of seabed mobility, um, other assets like existing cables and pipelines, things like that, uh, any cultural uh, sites of importance, um, and any ecologically important areas such as, uh, you know, eelgrass areas where fish spawn, um, things like that. So, you know, the step one as to how to avoid um, impacts from, from cabling is route planning, is to avoid those areas uh, that are sensitive in the first place. Of course, the cables have to get from A to B, so it's impossible to avoid everything. So then we come on to cable burial, which is always the primary method of uh, protecting the cable from damage and also um, protecting other seabed users, fishing industry, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, from the cables um, themselves. Lastly, we'd have externally applied protection. So in areas where burial might not be feasible, such as uh, very, very hard seabeds or areas where a cable crosses other assets and you'll get reduced burial automatically. Um, there's other other protection that you can apply to protect the cable um, at those locations and we'll, we'll go into those in a, in a minute. So as um, as we mentioned, uh, cable burial is always the primary method of, of protection for cables. Uh, so, you know, how do you come up with a recommended cable burial depth? Um, in, a, in a nutshell, there are some federal and state requirements, um, most predominantly in areas that are maintained for shipping by the US Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, they, they have requirements um, about how deep the cable should be in areas uh, that they dredge and maintain. Um, there's uh, industry guidance and best practice from uh, agencies such as uh, DNV um, and experience from other 
uh, organizations such as the North American Submarine Cable Owners Association, uh, who have um, quite a lot of experience of cables, uh, telecoms cables um, off the northeast of the US and how they've been um, damaged or not over the years by, uh, you know, by activity. Um, and also, you have to look at the risk appetite of the, the asset owners, uh, the regulatory agencies and things like that themselves. So um, you can work out, for example, probability of anchor strikes, depending on the, the vessel traffic of a particular area. Um, and then you can work out the likelihood of that happening in any one year. Uh, and then you can extrapolate that to get, uh, you know, the probability of an event over, say, a 30 year span of of how, the, you know, the life lifespan of a cable is um, is expected to be. Uh, which leads neatly into um, the cable burial risk assessment, which uh, at the moment is the um, the industry standard as to how to obtain a recommended cable depth of lowering for any given project. Um, it's a risk based methodology. Um, it was, excuse me, originally developed by the Carbon Trust in the UK, um, who commissioned a group of uh, subject matter experts to uh, to create a method of determining risk um, and therefore specify depth of lowering to reduce risk to a level known as the ALARP principle, which is as low as is reasonably practicable. It's, uh, it's impossible to eliminate risk. Uh, that would just lead to a lot of commercial implications. Um, so you need to just get the risk down to a low level that's acceptable to, uh, to all parties. So the CBRA, the outcome will, um, will be a minimum recommended depth of lowering at each point along the cable route. Uh, to achieve that, uh, the installation contractor selects a a burial method which will exceed uh, the minimum recommended depth of lowering, uh, which will allow for a little bit of margin for error in case the soil is a little bit harder than uh, expected um, and things like that. Uh, but this methodology works everywhere. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's location agnostic. It's a sort of scientific uh, method. Um, uh, with calculations and things like that, uh, so it's not uh, you know, it doesn't just pertain to any one particular area. Um, it works for uh, works worldwide. So the um, inputs into a CBRA are are many, um, but uh, basically, it's any external factor that can damage the cable, or or in can in turn can be damaged by the cable. Um, all those factors are taken into consideration, and some of them are natural, and some are human uh, human factors. So. Uh, probably first and foremost is, uh, is commercial vessel activity. So uh, the risk of damage to the cable from anchoring is generally speaking the highest one. Um, we also look at uh, commercial and to a lesser extent recreational fishing, what type of fishing activity occurs and what type of gear, et cetera, is used. We look at uh, dumping areas, dredging, seabed obstructions, uh, cultural sites, uh, unexploded ordnance, uh, existing seabed assets, uh, we mentioned that before, cables, pipelines, things like that. Uh, look at the topography, so uh, you avoid um, and try and mitigate things like steep slopes, uh, shallow areas, ravines, hard seafloor. Uh, sediment mobility is a big one. Um, there's a lot of studies done on that. Uh, because you can bury a cable and then if the uh, sediment moves over the years, the cable can either become more deeply buried or, or become exposed. Um, you also look at uh, weather, wind waves, tides and currents, um, and then uh, environmentally sensitive areas. Um, some of this uh, is covered in the planning and some of it is covered in the CBRA where you actually have to uh, you know, look at the risks and, and make a judgment accordingly. So just uh, to break up the text a little bit and to, to show um, everyone what, uh, what goes into a CBRA, uh, we have seabed bathymetry, so there'll be uh, geophysical surveys undertaken, which give you the actual, uh, you know, shape of the seabed, for want of a better word, and that gives you also some good indications about the surface uh, of that of the seabed, whether it's likely to be hard or soft. Uh, we have in the middle here uh, sediment mobility charts, uh, which give you the exact movement of any, you know, particular grain or sediment 
you know, how often they move and things like that. And that gives you a good indication of how mobile the seabed is in that particular area. Um, and then on the right, we have some uh, uh, geological charts here showing, uh, you know, what the actual soil breakdown is of, of the route. Um, and that gives you uh, two pieces of information, how hard the cable is to bury, uh, and also how deeply any uh, ship's anchors or fishing uh, gear is likely to penetrate. As we mentioned before, we look at uh, fishing activity. So um, you look at heat maps on the left here. Uh, this is particularly uh, hydraulic surf clam dredging, which is a technique which is generally uh, understood to penetrate the seabed, the deepest of, um, of all the fishing techniques. Um, you know, and therefore you try and avoid the areas if possible where that uh, activity is the greatest. So you see the areas in red here off, um, off Long Island where the uh, more activity, um, you'd probably think of routing the cable around that if um, if you've got the choice. Um, in the middle, uh, we see shipping activity. So this is um, data from 2019. It shows you uh, all the shipping lanes um, out of the New York area. Uh, so uh, you know, generally, cables will have to cross them, but you try and cross them at a right angle if uh, if humanly possible. You don't linger in those shipping lanes and. Uh, uh, you also might specify the depth of burial would be lower in them because you've got more likelihood of, uh, um, you know, of anchoring, whether it's deliberate or accidental, for example. Resulting from that, you analyze uh, the fishing activity and the commercial uh, shipping activity. I uh, like this picture here. It's an anchor of um, a Maersk uh, Triple E uh, container vessel. It weighs about 31 tons. Um, and uh, there's plans to deepen and widen shipping channels in the New York um, and New Jersey port area to accommodate those sorts of vessels um, in the future. So, you know, when you do these studies, you specifically look at the vessels that use the area and the plans for the future. Uh, you look at the anchors that those vessels use, and there are studies which show how deeply those anchors embed in the seabed should they, uh, should they be deployed. Um, and all that data goes into uh, recommending a, uh, a cable depth of lowering. Uh, the output, um, I apologize, these, uh, these screenshots are pretty small, uh, but basically the output of a CBRA is, um, you know, is a recommended depth. Uh, so we've got a risk, uh, basically a risk assessment on the left, uh, on the left, sorry, which uh, shows you um, an amalgamation of all the risks uh, of every section of the cable along the way. And it could be, you know, on a meter by meter basis almost. Um, you know, and out of that, you make uh, depth of lowering recommendations, which will lower the risk to something that's acceptable to uh, the cable owner and to the permitting authorities uh, and, uh, you know, the electricity um, authorities that are buying the power and things like that. This is a quick slide on the, the sequence of a project. Uh, you know, when can uh, cable installation commence? So um, permitting is, uh, you know, it's a mixture of, of um, state and, and federal uh, processes, um, but generally speaking, it's, it's coordinated by uh, BOEM, uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management under the uh, NEPA Act of 1969. So uh, BOEM starts the planning process and identifies uh, wind energy areas. Then it does a leasing process and interested parties that want to uh, lease the seafloor for an offshore wind project, um, uh, do, uh, you know, competitive bidding. Um, then there's a site assessment. So the winning uh, lessee um, has to submit a site assessment plan, which tells Bowen what they're going to do to assess the site. So it's basically a survey plan, uh, which uh, leads onwards to a construction and operations plan. Uh, which is a lot of work uh, that goes to Boehm. They approve it, hopefully, uh, or they come back with recommendations and things like that, which is what we saw they did with uh, with Vineyard Wind. Um, and once all those approvals are in place, uh, construction can uh, can start. But it takes quite a few years to get through that process. So getting on to cable installation itself, uh, there's two, two basic methods. Uh, number one is it's called simultaneous land burial. So that's where one vessel lays the cable and it gets buried um, at the same time. So one vessel is required um, and it's normally buried by, by plough or trenching ROV, uh, which we have a few examples in the, uh, in the following slides. 
Um, you know, advantages, just one vessel required. It can save a little bit on the day rate. Uh, disadvantages are uh, the actual burial is slower than the laying. So you need a, a decent period of good weather in order to start, uh, especially for export cable projects. Another method is post lay burial where the cable lay vessel will just lay the cable on the seabed and then another ship comes along with uh, uh, trenching equipment on it and buries the cable. So you get a bit more flexibility with regard weather windows and things like that, maybe a little bit more day rate uh, while two vessels are working. Uh, I think both methods are, are very common. Um, I can't say that one's got, uh, you know, huge advantages over the other. Um, it's all looked at on a case by case basis, um, but uh, that's the two, the two main methods. So if we look at simultaneous lay and burial, got some nice pictures to look at now, just to make it a little bit less, uh, less word intensive. On the left, we have a towed plow. So, um, you know, all these figures are a little bit uh, indicative because there's all sorts of variations on a theme, but generally speaking, a towed plow here, we can see it. Um, this is in a project off the east coast of the UK where you get a big tidal range. So they're able to place the plow on a, an area of the seabed that dries out and we can see the cable lay vessel in the distance uh, is also dried out. Um, um, but this gives a good indication of how they work. So the plow gets towed along. Uh, the cable here is laying on the mud. Uh, if it's actually in the deep water, it won't do this. It just hangs in the water column. It goes in through the plow. You can see it come down here through the plowshare and it gets uh, sort of injected, if you will, down into the seabed um, in one kind of uh, simultaneous operation. Uh, normally, uh, with the standard sort of plows, you can get to about three meters or 10 feet of burial uh, and the machines itself roughly 15 meters, which is 50 feet or so long, weighing about 50 tons. Another type of plow is, um, is this towed jetting sled, uh, quite good for shallow water and soft soils, uh, and they're pretty cheap. Uh, these were used to install, for example, um, Neptune cable uh, off, uh, off New York. Uh, they come in a huge variety of sizes. Some of them are huge. Uh, this one here can bury the cable about 10 feet again. Um, they can't cope with soils that are harder than uh, you know, the really soft sandy soils. Anything hard, you know, they struggle with because they use water jetting uh, as a means of fluidizing the seabed um, to create a trench for the cable to, to sit in. So as per a normal plow, uh, the cable will come off the back of the cable ship, goes into this bell mouth here, down through the plow share. Uh, this is, oops, Sorry about that. Uh, this is obviously normally deployed and under the seabed and the cable will come out here uh, at its at its burial depth. We can see the right hand slide here is also a towed uh, jetting sled, uh, which um, but it's a lot larger. So this particular one can bury cable about eight meters deep, uh, which is about 25 feet or so. Um, good in uh, you know, very soft soils, things like that, where you want the cable deep uh, and out of the way. Uh, some of them can also have chain cutters on them for cutting through slightly harder, you know, harder soils. So there's a big variety. They're very diff difficult to, um, you know, to kind of label and pigeonhole. More simultaneous lay and burial tools. Um, on the left is, is a barge with a thing called a vertical injector tool. Um, the cable is in the cable tank on the vessel. The injector tool is a section several sections of steel that hang off the side of the barge, they bolt together um, and they use water jetting. So you have water pumps on the barge and the, the nozzles on the tool will, um, you know, will fluidize the seabed uh, and, uh, and the cable gets laid and buried simultaneously. Quite good in shallow water and very soft soils. You can get deep burial depths. Um, they used a lot in, uh, in, in the telecoms industry in places where there's soft soils like, uh, you know, Singapore Harbour and things like that, and they can get the cable down deep. So they're out of the way um, and not in danger of, uh, of being hit by, uh, you know, ship's anchors and things like that. But if the water gets too deep, any more than, um, you know, 15, 20 metres or so, then it's more of a struggle to use these. Um, but then we come to a couple of... Uh, different uh, track trenches here. So these are a kind of combination between a remotely operated vehicle. Uh, they're not towed, they're self-propelled, um, but they can operate in either post lay burial mode where the cable's already on the seabed and then the, the trencher deploys over it and buries, 
or simultaneous lane barrier where the cable will come off the vessel and go down through the cable pathway. You know, these are huge machines. You know, this one here on the left weighs about 170 tons. The one on the right is also large, 125 tons or so. You know, and they can bury three, four, five meters or so. Um, you know, the sandy soils or if it's harder soils, they have chain cutters which kind of swing down and cut a trench. So they're pretty cool things. And uh, I think tools like this will be used quite a lot in the US once the industry gets going. We're looking at post lay burial, which, if you remember, is lay the cable first and then bury it afterwards. Uh, it's normally done by remotely operated vehicle. Uh, so we have some uh, track trenches here uh, on the left and in the middle. Uh, idea of their capability. So normally the numbers on them refer to about the horsepower, uh, which uh, encompasses both the water jetting pumps and, and hydraulic power packs. So. Uh, Normally three meters or so of burial, which is 10 feet, is about what you got, you'll get out of them in the right soil conditions. Um, if it's soft, they can normally go into a free flying mode as well. So you take the tracks off, you put skids on uh, so they're lighter, they don't sink into the soil quite so much. Uh, but generally speaking, most soils, uh, they're tracked, um, as you can see in the middle and left, uh, left pictures. Got some other burial techniques as well. On the left, we have uh, a tool called a mass flow excavator. Um, in effect, it's uh, it's basically fans uh, which suck water in the side and then jet it out the bottom. Um, and this uh, is suspended from a ship over the cable or whatever it is you want to bury or debury if you want to expose cable. They they can do that as well. Um, they're perceived to have a little bit more. Uh, environmental impact in uh, in the, the you know turbidity in the water column so there's been quite a lot of um, uh, technological changes in the last few years where these are a lot more controllable than they used to be and they say they can uh, you know speed them up and slow them down to do what they need to do but without just creating a lot of um, uh, turbidity in the water column uh, we have here on the right we have a multi-mode plow so this is um, independent of cable laying uh, it can cut a trench or clear a path in advance of laying a cable, and then the cable can get laid into the trench, which has been created by this plow. Uh, then you can change the plow into a kind of backfill mode, and you drag it across the cable route, and it scoops all the sediment that's been created, um, uh, you know, set aside during the, the trench creation, and it will backfill it into the trench and, uh, and cover the cable on, um, over. Uh, they can also just be used for route clearance as well, if there's boulders and things like that. Other types of uh, cable protection um, we have here on the left is uh, rock dumping or uh, rock placement, as the rock contractors like to say. Um, and it's normally done via trailing suction hopper dredger. Uh, we can see the left photo, um, well, rendering, should I say, is, um, is the rock pipe. Um, this one will have cameras on it and sonar so that you know it's very accurately uh, positioned above the cable. Um, and they, uh, it's a controlled full um, kind of system. So you don't want uh, rock just dropping from, you know, great depths onto a cable that can damage it. So they, they kind of place it a little bit more gently than that. Uh, this photo here is the vessel um, putting rock uh, scour protection around a, a monopile. Um, on the right, we have uh, grout or rock bags, which uh, uh, can be placed here or here or there. They're not used for long for long runs. It's, they're very specific. Uh, sometimes at cable crossings or areas such as where the cable um, transits out of uh, the actual monopile or transformer station itself. So uh, you know they use discreetly here and there as an option. Uh, concrete mattresses here on the left um, are fairly common. Uh, normally at cable crossings, right? So uh, when you when one cable crosses another, uh, you need to have some separation between the two cables. You don't want them just rubbing against each other. So normally there's a layer of concrete mats between uh, between the two. Uh, the top cable will be laid over it, and then you'll have another layer of mattresses uh, placed over the top. Um, so they normally have tapered edges. Uh, you know, it's possible to fish over them. Uh, they're normally uh, positioned quite accurately so that they, they lay alongside each other. They're not kind of uh, stacked on top of each other and uh, things like that. So uh, you try and bury the cable a little bit, uh, but, you know, at cable crossings particularly, you know, it's it's difficult to get the full burial of the rest. So 
so mattresses are used at these locations to both protect the cable, uh, you know, and also to protect uh, other users from the cable itself. Um, variations on these are, are frond mattresses, which uh, basically are concrete mattresses that have, uh, you know, artificial kind of grass on them, for want of a better word. Uh, uh, they're sometimes used around foundations and they stop scouring, but they also um, do provide habitat and shelter for, for wildlife. Um, you know, the whole use of these is a, there's a phrase called nature inclusive designs. It's a whole kind of design philosophy, uh, which is more than just the mattresses. It's, it's everything else. So it's, it's like um, the philosophy is to look at the species that exist in those areas, try and design everything around the wind farm, um, cable protection, scour protection, design of things like foundations or jacket structures, you know, to provide a habitat and to not impact uh, the species that are indigenous to, to that particular area. So quite a lot of studies gone in in that area in Europe, um, and I'm sure the same uh, is, is here as well in the US. We also come on to um, articulated split pipe, uh, which tends to be used if cables cross things like reefs, uh, very shallow rocky areas, um, and also at the end of cable protection systems at, um, at wind turbines, at transformer platforms, and uh, the ends of cable repair joints, which I have a photo of in a, in a minute. Also, Euroduct uh, is quite commonly used at cable crossings. So, um, as I mentioned just now, the cable is sandwiched between two layers of concrete mattresses. You don't normally want the concrete mattress to lay directly on the cable. You'd apply this Euroduct, which is a, a polyurethane split system that's uh, that's held on with uh, stainless steel straps, and that's applied on the ship. Um, it gets laid down over the bottom mattress, and then the top mattresses will get laid on top. Um, and here on the right, we have cable protection systems uh, that generally pertains to uh, where the cable goes into a J tube at a wind turbine or at a transformer platform. Um, and the idea of these cable protection systems is that it limits movement of cable and protects it before it gets into full burial. A necessary part of the cable um, industry is doing joints, uh, whether it's for repairing a cable in the event of a fault or if it's during installation. So, for example, a long export cable, uh, no cable ship will be able to take the entire length of cable in one go. It might have to go and, um, you know, and refill, as it were, which would necessitate, necessitate doing an offshore joint. So here's a couple of images here just to give people an idea of the scale of uh, high voltage AC export cable um, joint. Uh, so we see on the left here, this is being lifted out of the jointing container on a ship and the photo on the right shows it being laid over the side of the ship uh, in a kind of omega. Uh, when this is laid on the seabed, it'll be in an omega kind of configuration. Um, and then this will be uh, buried um, often by a mass flow excavator uh, after it's laid. Um, joints like this can take uh, take a week or so to do. Um, they're, they're a very highly skilled and quite expensive operation. Um, so you need a good weather, good weather window to get these done. Uh, but they have the same lifespan as a cable um, if they're done properly and if they're buried. Um, they're a little harder to bury than the cable itself, but uh, they tend to be, uh, you know, the targets to bury them to the same depth as the cable in the, you know, in that surrounding area. Uh, it leads us on to cable surveys. Um, so uh, we saw from the Vineyard Wind uh, environmental impact statement, for example, that Bowen will require Vineyard Wind to undertake uh, periodic cable surveys to ensure that the cable, uh, you know, remains at its uh, specified burial depth um, for the duration of the project. And normally the, the cable surveys are fairly closely spaced at the beginning. And then when you get an idea of the kind of patterns of burial or deburial over time, you know, you can space them out a little bit further. So uh, cables that get shallower, for example, uh, you know, mobile seabed sediments, um, you know, obviously mean that the cables at risk of damage. And also it means that the cable could, you know, risk anyone else that's using that piece of the seabed, such as, you know, fishing, the fishing industry and whatnot. 
if the cable gets deeper, uh, what that means is the ampacity is reduced. So it can't dissipate the heat so effectively and you can't uh, basically uh, you know, have the same current uh, running down the cable. It can't take as much electricity, you know, for want of a better word. So you, know, you want to bury the cable deeply enough that it's protected, but not too deeply. Um, otherwise you can't, uh, you, know, you can't maybe take the whole output of the wind farm um, down it electrically. So we have a few uh, techniques here. This is a, called a TSS system, which is uh, basically like a metal detector. Uh, we have uh, Pangeo sub bottom profiler here. It uses a system that's a bit like a multi beam echo sounder. It uh, uses uh, you know, sound which um, penetrates the seabed and it bounces back off the cable itself. That's post processed to give you an idea of where the cable is. Uh, this one here on the top right is called a TSS 350, and that's a tone detecting system. So you can put a tone on the cable, uh, just like an uh, electrician puts a tone in a cable in the house and detects it in the walls. Uh, same kind of theory. They all have their pros and cons, uh, but the deeper the cable is buried, the harder it is to detect it. So areas where, for example, the US Army Corps of Engineers needs really deep burial, you know, the problem in the future then is, you know, is how to survey that. It's, it's pretty difficult. Uh, Last couple of slides. I think time is going well. Um, I wanted to put these in because it's uh, you know a newer technology and um, it's it's definitely being implemented and required uh, by the authorities. Is is cable sensing? Uh, so the first system is called distributed temperature sensing. Uh, so it's basically rack mounted equipment in the control uh, the control center of the of the wind farm. It utilizes uh, optical fibers within the cable, um, and what it does is it measures the temperature um, at uh, discrete intervals along the entire length of the cable. So depending on how long the cable is, it could be every meter to every five meters. Um, so, you know, why would you want to do that? Um, cables can be operated maximum temperature for a XLPE insulated cable is, is 90 degrees Celsius. If you go over that, uh, you risk damage to the insulation. So a distributed temperature sensing system can show any hot spots along the cable. Uh, maybe the burial's got deeper, maybe the cable's over something metallic, which is causing a hot spot that you don't know about, things like that. Um, also gives you trends. So if the cable um, is, is running cooler than you'd expect for a given load, for example, that could indicate that the depth of burial is reducing and that could give you clues about uh, you know, future remedial burial operations and something so you can plan them in advance rather than having to do them in an emergency. So um, uh, some countries like Belgium, they accept these systems in lieu of doing actual marine surveys. So, uh, you know, less environmental impacts, less cost. Um, and it looks like hopefully some sort of research will be done, which, um, you know, it means that that kind of philosophy could be applicable in other places. We also have, uh, which is, I would say, a little bit less often used, um, kind of similar theory. It's distributed uh, vibration sensing or distributed acoustic sensing. Basically, that also uses fibers in the uh, in the cable, and it turns the cable into a big microphone, uh, for want of a better word. So, um, uh, you know, what that does is that if um, if there's any any sounds. Uh, you can ex you can hear anchors. Uh, you can hear fishing activity. If the cable is getting shallower, you can hear kind of marine, you know, just general increased ambient noise. Um, and you can tie the system into the uh, uh, AIS system of vessels. So if your cable gets hit, um, you'll get an acoustic spike. You can see which ship is there and and things like that. So it really helps the operator of the systems, uh, you know, monitor their monitor their cables. Uh, it also can be used as some types of cable fault, which happen, um, such as partial discharge, which can be very difficult to locate with traditional techniques. But partial discharge is basically a, a partial breakdown of the insulation, and it creates, uh, you know, a ground fault, but also a kind of spike in noise. So these systems can also detect that, you know, and give a hint about fault location if um, if the worst happens. So it's quite interesting. These systems are coming on the market now and the benefits that they they provide. You know, Boehm knows of them, uh, so they uh, are, are putting in the requirements for at least the distributed 
temperature sensing into their um, you know COP approvals and things like that. So we'll probably be seeing more and more of these systems being um, being specified by the uh, wind farm and cable operators. And I think that's about it. So uh, it's what one uh, forty-five. So um, I'll hand over to to Morgan, and I'm very happy to try and answer any questions that uh, that anyone may have. Thanks, Duncan. I think that was a really great overview of this very uh, complex topic. Let me go to the Q&A and, and see what kind of questions that we have from the public. Um, and I, um, again, folks, if you have questions, use the Q&A function um, in WebEx to submit those questions, and we'll do our best to, to get through as many as we can in the time that we have. So let's see. Looks like so. Um, I guess the first question that is coming that's coming across um, in a couple spots is how early in the design phase should the cable burial risk assessment be developed, and how has this been done in in Europe? Um, as we often look to Europe as kind of the the example for this industry. I would say uh, the cable route planning process uh, should be undertaken as early as possible. Uh, you get uh, there's a sort of cost influence curve. So the earlier you do these, uh, the earlier you do them in a project um, life cycle, is you get the most benefit for the least kind of cost impact uh, for doing planning. The actual cable barrel risk assessment itself, at least uh, in the US, they're um, uh, they're submitted as part of the construction and operations plan uh, to Bowen. So, um, yeah, they're done obviously in advance of uh, any of the of the cable scope going to market. So, um, when this the the cable burial risk assessment is is created, how much detail on the different technologies is done? Um, is that done at like specific route intervals or is it more general? Can technologies be interchanged easily along the route? Um, or is that something that is done more in situ if that change has to occur? Yeah, so the cable bearer risk assessment will give a, a natural recommended depth of lowering along the route. Um, that can be followed up by a thing called a burial assessment study, which tells you how to achieve that burial. Uh, you know, so obviously that looks at the soil types, the recommended DOL, and you'll come up with a matrix of burial machines uh, that will have, you know, a good success of achieving that uh, or less. Um, and it's quite possible to have a mix of burial and installation methodologies along the same cable, for example. Uh, that's that's quite common. Uh, we have a question coming in about. Um trying to understand a little bit more about the technologies that are used. Um, we have a question here about um, the toad plow, and um, is this usually done at a fixed depth, or is there an ability to change the depth as conditions vary? Yeah, so a plow, for example, um, will have a maximum burial depth. Uh, so a lot of them are about three, three meters or 10 feet or so. Uh, if you don't need that full depth, um, they do have the means to reduce that. So they have, uh, maybe if I go back, get the photos. So um, they're all hydraulic and they, uh, the, you know, the stabilizers can raise or lower, um, which will raise or lower the uh, actual depth of the plowshare in the seabed, it, you know, itself. So if you have a three meter plow and you only need two meters of burial depth, uh, you wouldn't bury at three meters because you're just increasing wear and tear, slowing the speed down, increasing costs, and it's it's unnecessary. So, so yeah, they're not, um, you know, if it's a three meter plow, they can bury, you know, up to that, basically. Uh, the jet sleds, um, you know, you can reduce the angle of the tool, um, but then they, can change the effectiveness of the burial. So generally speaking, if it's more of a toad jet sled like this one in the middle, you would change the tool to a shorter one if you didn't need the full uh, 10 foot of burial. 
So yeah, there are options uh, to change the burial depth for any given uh, any given tool. And is that done? Um, but that's done by sensors on the tool. I'm assuming if if you're coming across harder harder sediments or softer sediments. Hopefully, you've got uh, good uh, good technical survey data and all the planning's done in advance. Um, so that you know roughly what you're going to expect. But yeah, you know, it's quite common to encounter soil that's a little harder, you know, or softer than than you expect. Uh, so they have sensors on them. So for example, with a plow, uh, they have load cells in the tow bridle. Um, so if uh, if the soil gets harder, the tow forces will will increase. Um, and it's the same with remotely operated vehicles. Uh, let's pull one of those up. Um, so here, for example, you can see the jet legs on this uh, on this ROV. Uh, they have sensors in them, uh, load cells, so that you know that the pressure, you know, the back pressure that's being, uh, you know, applied to these jet legs as you're, you know, moving moving them through the soil and jetting. So, um, you know, yes, you do have when you are burying, uh, you know, the operators of these uh, these machines um, and the data that you get off them will give you a pretty good indication of, of how hard the soil is. And it might be just something as simple as, you know, you can't get these jet legs, you know, they're deployed hydraulically, um, but you can't get them down to their full depth, for example, uh, because the soil was you know, too hard. Uh, but what all these machines have is, is capability, um, you know, their capabilities are known in advance. So if you know a kind of soil uh, hardness or a shear strength, you know, you're specifying the machine to cope with the soil that you're finding you know, on site. Um, so it's not, it, hopefully there's not too much guesswork um, involved up front. Uh, thank, thanks for that explanation. It's uh, super helpful, at least for me, uh, and hopefully for, for others on this, on this webinar. Uh, we have a question about um, how water depth um, might affect the ability to reach um, I guess, burial depth using certain technologies. I don't know if there's something you can share about that, about um, which technologies are, are better for certain um, depths of water column. Yeah, uh, so I'll go back to, I'll go back to ROVs. So traditional ROVs like these, um, they're normally rated to a depth of, of two to 3,000 meters. Uh, so, you know, any uh, burial that they're capable of, as long as it's in the depth rating of, of these vehicles, you know, you're good to go. Um, tools that are towed, uh, if I go to the previous slide, um, a lot of plows are rated to, uh, you know, roughly a thousand or 1500 meters, something like that. Um, not all of them, there are shallower water ones as well. Uh, but they uh, they have, if they have jetting, they have onboard water pumps and things like that. So they can go pretty deep. Something that's towed but has surface supplied water. I don't think I really covered this, but uh, the jetting sleds uh, tend to have water supplied from pumps on the on the host vessel. So you have quite large hoses running from the vessel down, and you can just see the top of one right here. You know, and that limits the the depth that these can operate. So normally, uh, you know, a hundred meters or so is is a pretty good indicative of maximum of this type of um, of this type of uh, towed vehicle. Um, if you get to an injector tool, that's normally shallower water. So sort of 20, maybe 30 meters is an absolute maximum for uh, injector tools. So, you know, shallow water, generally speaking. A lot of these really big tracked ones, they can go pretty deep, 500 meters, you know, to 1,000, maybe 1,500, something like that. So they're kind of in between the traditional, you know, full-on ROV and, and the shallower water tool. So, you know, I think the water depths that at least conventional wind is going to uh, be in, uh, which is you know 30, 40, maybe 50 meters maximum of uh, of the northeast of the U.S. Uh, before you start talking about floating, of course, um, you know, there's not too many limitations to be honest. Um, I guess we'll switch topics a little bit, and uh, we have a question. We have a few questions about. Um, if there's a preferred mitigation measure for cable protection that could be used in areas of high fishing activity that would protect 
both the cable, but also enable fishing to continue. So is there some sort of industry standard out there, or is it really more site specific in nature? You know, I would, I would say it's, it's site specific because you have to look at what actual fishing activity goes on in those areas. There are standards for crossings, uh, crossing designs and things like that, which is normally pertains to how two assets are crossed and the separation between them rather than uh, the actual burial depth or the protection that's applied to them. Um, you know, I'd probably just say that it's in everyone's interest, the asset owner, the regulating authorities, and of course, you know, the, the fishing industry that uses that area that, that protection is, you know, adequate and enables, you know, doesn't, you know, hinder any activities, put it that way. Um, so, yeah, there's no sort of hard and fast standard or rule. It's definitely a case by case basis. All right, I think we have time for a couple more questions. So I'm um, just going to look through these and see what topics we may not have covered right now. Um, actually, there's a good one that has come in. You know, we're talking about cable installation here, but has is there any thought throughout the process, either the cable barrel risk assessment or some of the other processes that that happen when determining how to lay cable about decommissioning and about what role installation has in the overall potential removal for, for cables? You know, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure if decommissioning is considered in a COP as uh, something that has to be looked at in the future. I haven't been that involved in that side of stuff. I would say that buried cables can be removed. It's done fairly regularly and uh, a lot of, for example, telecoms cables are being decommissioned. So it is possible to do a do some work to determine whether the environmental impact of removing a cable because you're disturbing the seabed all over again, you know, from something that may have been there decades and you know, is buried and hidden from sight, um, whether that outweighs you know, the environmental gains of, you know, of removing it. So a CBRA doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't consider uh, the impacts of removal. The deeper the burial, you know, the more impact there will be removing it is a, probably a fairly simple statement to make. All right, thank you for that. And uh, just one more question while we, we still have time for it. Um, once cables are in place, um, what is there or is there an ability to um, draw on additional development or use those existing cables to um, either tap into transmission capacity or or other future projects or are these cables once they're laid usually kind of set for that particular project and not for um, advancement? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, if it's traditional HVAC export cables from a given project to shore, uh, they are project specific. Um, on the other hand, if you look at, for example, I think we lost your audio, Duncan. It looks like we lost uh, Duncan's audio on that, so I apologize um, for the inconvenience. And we will um, just look to wrap up today. Um, and just again, thank you, Duncan, for for going through not only the presentation but those questions as well. And um, there's a lot of good questions that we weren't able to, to cover today, but thank you for joining us for this learning from the experts webinar. And as a reminder, this webinar recording and presentation slides will be available on our website at nicerta.ny.gov 
forward slash OSW dash webinar dash series. We have two upcoming webinars. The first is on June 9th by uh, will be presented by Julia Robinson Wilmot with Norman Doe Associates, who will describe the technology behind digital aerial surveys and how they can inform the offshore wind development process. Also on June 23rd, Gordon Perkins and Kiva Vandergeest with Environmental Design and Research will present on the environmental factors that affect uh, visibility of offshore wind farms from shore and the methods for modeling visual impacts. Uh, you can also register for those and future webinars through our events page at wind.nicerta.gov. Additionally, if you have a request for future topics that you would like to hear about in this series, please email us at offshorewind at nicerta.ny.gov. Again, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.